So please, everyone, welcome Francesco Stracciolo, who will tell us about the domain-driven frontends. Hey, Francesco, welcome. How is Hi. it going? Hi, nice. Thank you. Um, I'm happy right. for your uh, short on the waxing. On the waxing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, like everybody has to like put their own like part to the whole whole picture. But yeah, so I have to say like I see that you didn't write just one, but actually two books about the software development. And I do understand that this is something which takes like extreme amount of effort to do, right? So yeah. maybe you can just quickly tell us about like what is it for? What is it about before we jump into the, today's topic? Uh, yeah, I wrote uh, uh, one book and a half. In reality, the first book is about uh, how to build a, a front-end application without frameworks. It is called the frameworkless front-end development. It's about uh, you know rendering without frameworks or routing without frameworks and so on. Uh, the second one is uh, I'm currently writing it, but is already published on LeanPub. So I publish the chapter every every time that I have something to publish, and this is about. Uh, uh making decisions in software development so how to help a team to choose the right framework the right tool the right architecture and so on sounds pretty interesting so who would be like the best target group for this kind of booth who would get like the most value from this kind of stuff it's more like for the uh, leads or more like for the intermediates or everyone maybe um uh, okay, uh, the first book about frameworks is also from middle uh, and senior. Okay, it's not the code is not so complicated. Uh, the second one about decision it's uh, more for senior developer because you have to talk also about team organizations, uh, uh, company structure, and so on. So it's uh, a bit from an angle level point of view. So sounds pretty good. So you hear that, Thank folks? You. Like, if if somebody like sounds interesting, please go check that out because I believe it's full of like great and actionable experience. And now let's just not delay any more. And please, Francesco, tell us about the domain-driven frontends. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to start the tenth edition of uh, JS Day uh, with this uh, keynote title "Domain-Driven Frontend." As you can imagine from the title, I will. Uh, talk about some uh, domain-driven design technique uh, techniques applied to front-end development you know, or single-page application okay, that we wrote every day. Uh, before I start talking about actual code, I need to introduce myself a little better. Uh, it, it's quite funny because one of my former colleagues, Francesco Fullone, it's one of the team of the group, uh, said to me that uh, sometimes it's better to introduce yourself at the end of the talk to keep people interested on the topic and not on yourself. Uh, but this time, um, uh, but this time, uh, I need to introduce myself before because the story, my personal and professional story, is part of this talk. Uh, I am Francesco. Okay, uh, I am a partner and developer at Flowing. We are. Uh, a remote, uh, a fully remote software company based in Italy. Uh, as you can see in the slide, my code name is Strats. Uh, please call me in that way because only two people in the world call me with my full name. It is my wife and my mother, and both of them were they very hungry. So, uh, as you can see, I'm quite sensitive about uh, about my name. Uh, if you want to talk with me about this talk, about the books, or whatever you want. I suggest to uh, follow me on Twitter because it's the only uh, real uh, social network that I use for work. The other social network I used to talk about, Italian politics, as you can imagine, it's not so interesting. So I suggest you work on Twitter. Um, I started working in JavaScript in 2009. And uh, before that, I wrote professionally Java code for, I think, seven six or seven years, I don't remember correctly, okay? And uh, when I switched to, to JavaScript, I started working with AngularJS. So imagine my pressure, okay? I was accustomed to an ecosystem that were uh, typed, strongly typed, full of infrastructure, full of 
things uh, already designed by the path of, you know, uh, frameworks like Springs or um, Hibernate and so on. And then I started working with AngularJS. It was quite a shock, okay? After a while, and eventually, I started to, I stopped worrying uh, and I started to love Undefined and just like Strange Love. Start, stopped world and start to love the bomb, okay? Um, but you may say, why are you telling me this? Why it's important for your talk? Well, the point is that while I was studying JavaScript, I always, and I still doing that, I'm keeping a shoe in the, in the backend ecosystem, in Java ecosystem, uh, right now working with Kotlin, for example, in these last couple of years. And in, the, in, the, in, the, in these years, I study a lot these two books that you can read here, the famous blue book of the one Demon Design, the first one by Eric Evans, and the famous red book about implementing the Rain Demon Design by Vork Vernon. This is my personal history. This is uh, uh, the background uh, that explains why I'm giving you this talk today. Fast forward to 2015. Uh, this is a frame from the incredibly famous uh, talk by Dan Abramov about hot reloading with time travel at React Europe when he, he introduced Redux for the first time. When I saw this talk, and probably the most of the people that saw this talk reacted like, uh, you know, wow, it's so cool. Everything is based on events. Uh, everything will be fine, will be perfect. Then I used the Redux in production for some years, okay? So uh, I use the dev tools, I use the testing tools, I use Redux Saga, for example. And after a while, I just thought about my Java background and I said, okay, this is very, very similar. Redux It's very similar to event sourcing. Event sourcing is a pattern for backend application uh, that emerged from the domain-driven design community where everything, every change to the system is uh, originated from events, just like Redux. And uh, the problem of Redux are very similar to the problem of event sourcing. And uh, looking from the other side of the coin, the good part of event sourcing are exactly the good part of Redux. So I felt, you know, some type of connection between DDD and front-end community. Uh, fast forward again to nowadays, and nowadays micro front-ends are effect, okay? We have module federation, we have more of one way to implement micro front-end. Uh, we have a talk, I think, today about micro front-end that we follow surely, but we are in the same situation. Micro front-ends are, uh, originated from microservices, of course. And microservices um, are a huge part of the DDD community about uh, the bounded context, subdomain, core domain, and so on. So there is a relationship uh, between DDD and front-end, but most of the time this relationship is hidden. Uh, and this is because what I noticed after that I noticed is, you know, about event sourcing, microservices, micro front-end, Redux, is that front-end community and DDD communities don't talk too much each other. If you participate uh, in a DDD conference like DDD Europe, they will talk, uh, or not at all, or very, very, very few talks about front-end, and on the other hand, on, in front-end talks about, or in front-end blog posts, you will never find uh, um, so uh, some root in DDD uh, communities. It's very, very rare to do that. So why I'm here at the end? I'm here because I want to start talking about DDD to front-enders and also vice versa. I announced to you that I will try to give this exact talk also to DDD community to show the relationship between these two important parts uh, of software development ecosystem. The main problem when starting talking about domain-driven design is, is that is a very, very 
vast argument. It's a universe, okay? So with this short slide, I want you to um, talk, let you understand what this talk will be about. Uh, domain driven design is divided in two main branches. The first one is the strategic domain driven design. This is all about uh, dividing the, the domain in smaller parts with context mapping, using ubiquitous language, using data storming by Alberto Brandolini, defining your bounded context. Then you have the tactical techniques that put the strategy into action. And this is what I will talk about today, how to put tactical DDD in practice in a, a JavaScript application. So I, I'm going to introduce you to entities, value objects, services, aggregates, and domain events. So uh, problem solved, but um, I don't want you to think that um, everything that is born from DDD is actually doable as is in uh, JavaScript. I don't want to say that. But what I want to say is that it's important to know that the, the principles that are behind the DDD and also to build a common ground and ubiquitous language with backend developers in order to you know, have a better communication between your team. So brace yourself, I'm going to show you some code now. Um, the code is, will, will be, is uh, hosted on GitHub. You can see there flowing IS. DDD front end, and I will share it on um, I will share it on my social network later that after the talk. A quick note about the code. Uh, you can use, if you're going to look at after my talk, you can use the history of the of the of the repository like a slide deck. Every commit has uh, a small feature or change or changes a small part of the, of the application. In this way, you can navigate through the code just like my talk. Okay, a small disclaimer uh, before I start. I decided to use uh, JavaScript. And I did that, uh, and not TypeScript, for example, uh, and I did that for two main reasons. The first one is, there, is because this talk, the, the actual code for this talk, is born from a real world use case uh, where my team and I helped a team's client, uh, sorry, a client's team uh, to refactor a very, very large backbone application. Um, and they had a lot of business logic inside the UI component. So what do we, Try to do that we succeeded was to extract the UI code and put it in domain objects, like I will show you in a moment. At the time, we used JavaScript because it was quite difficult to add another bundler in the project, as you can imagine. So, for historical reason, I kept uh, JavaScript in my code. Uh, my application will not be on Backbone, but it will be on React to, to let more people to understand what is happening under the hood. The other reason is because I think that uh, DDD is most, uh, most uh, the most important part of DDD are the principle and not the actual implementation. The actual implementation will be more easier in TypeScript because I can just copy paste examples from, I don't know, Java or C Sharp. I can use classes, I can use interfaces, I can use the same uh, pieces of code that I use uh, on, that are using in the DDD community. But what I wanted to demonstrate to you with my code is that it's actually doable also without types, also in JavaScript. So, okay, let's start with actual code. Okay, so uh, before showing the code, I will show the application, okay? It's just a random list of um, employees um, and I imagine that I am the manager of a company and I can promote to, I don't know, senior developer or whatever you want, some of the employees clicking on the heart icon, okay? This is my uh, basic application. So let's start with the code. And as you can see on the right, I will always have 
uh, a small vocabulary about DDD techniques. Um, and then we arrive to repositories and entities in a moment. So, okay, I have my index.js application. It's a standard re create React app application. And then I have, you know, um, the app content, the, the, app, the application itself. Let's just take the employees repository and I will show the code of the repository in a moment. At the startup, it just take the list from the from a server, okay. And then when the when the data arrive from the server, you just put them in state. This is a classic uh, uh, React pattern. I get I get the data and I put them in the state. When I click on the promote button on the icon, I just map the employees, the existing employees, to a new array. When I change the promoted attribute of the selected employee to true. Then I change the state, so I update the UI, and then I invoke asynchronously the backend. And if there is an error, I manage it. Right now, I just print a console error and I reset the employees to the previous one. I, here I can show a toast, I can show something else. Let me uh, in, explain to you the first two concept of DDD that I am introducing in my talk, that is repository and entities. A repository is, a an, is an object with the purpose of store and retrieve entities. Its form should be independent from the data source. And I will show this right now. As you can see, the, as, you can, as I explained to you, the data is completely random. There is no real backend here, okay? It's just uh, some random data created with Faker.js. Uh, if you don't know it, Faker is a really, really cool library that is, can be used to create random data. I use it in all of my talk and workshop when I did a bunch of data. But you can also use it when working, where you need to, you know, uh, create something that you don't that you don't have actual data to work with. Okay. Uh, before going to the entities, I want you to concentrate on the list method. As you can see, I've wrapped my random data in a promise with a set timeout. Why I did that? I did that because the form of a repository should be independent from the data source. And what is the most basic way to design an asynchronous uh, repository? Because every front-end repository is always asynchronous, okay? With a promise. So I've wrapped my simple, stupid data source with a promise. I could, I can use an RX stream. I can use also a callback if you prefer. It's not important. The important stuff is that you keep your public API independent from the data source. In this way, when I should change to a real backend, the rest of my application will not change at all. So. What is an entity and where is the entity inside this uh, simple file? An entity is just an object defined primarily by its identity and that can, be, can change over time. So uh, to keep this thing easy and short, everything that is, has an ID is uh, most of the time is an, called an entity. As you can see here, I create an array of entities with a faker, with a fake ID that is a UID. So it's a unique ID. It's not a case that we use the ID usually as a key for React Repeater, for example, because uh, the way to identify an entity is by its ID and not by its values. So, okay, let's go on with the next commit, next commit, the, next, the, the, the only difference between two, the two commit is a day that I added a, a small, sorry, I will fix the zoom. I added a small uh, business logic to the, um, to the, to the click of a promotion, okay? I added the business rule to that. And I say that in order to promote an employee, I have to take the 
reviews from, it, from its peers, from the server. So I have another uh, repository. And uh, I also have, uh, I need to calculate the average ranking. And if it's this rev average ranking is less than seven, I created a constant up there, then I cannot promote him. So I just print a window alert and I stop the execution. If the random data gives to me an average higher than seven, then I promote it without problems. Okay, uh, we have actual business logic inside the UI, but uh, you know it's uh, the, the the team of the backbone project thought, okay, it's not a problem. It's small. We can go on with that. So let's go on. Let's add another another rule this time. So I create another rule because uh, POs are, I don't know, uh, project manager said that we need another rule, okay, from the backlog. So right now I, I, I need, another, I need a, another rule that is about the number of reviews. I just don't need to check about the ranking, the average ranking, but also about the number of reviews. I need at least four review to continue my check. So I need to have more than four reviews and I need that this review has a, an average value higher than seven. Now, imagine that you do this kind of stuff for years in a very, very huge business application. Your code will become uh, easily a mess. Uh, so what is the first thing that you do uh, in this situation when uh, you want to separate UI from logic? Well, the first thing that you do is to, what is, is, uh, is to add what is called a service, okay? Uh, a DDD, in DDD, a service is an object that orchestrates the steps required to fulfill command imposed by the client. So in my scenario, I remove the employee repository and uh, uh, review repository, the true random data repository, and I introduce the employee service, service in this project, in this component. So I, I use the employee service inside the click handler. And if there is an error in my handler, then I just window alert the error. As you can imagine right now, the employee service is just a copy paste of the code that I have in the UI. Instead of printing the window, window alert, I just throw an error when the, uh, my business rule are not applicable. I want you to um, notice, uh, let you notice something. Notice the signature of the promote. I need the promote element, of course. I need the, the set of employees and I need the set employees, the callback, okay? The set state from React. We will go, uh, we are going to remove them. We will need only the pr to promote element because, you know, the employees, the list of employees and the set employees are part of my infrastructure, are part of the React ecosystem, if you want. I know that in this case are just, um, you know, simple callback or simple data, but the main, uh, in, the most important part of DDD is to keep your business logic separated and isolated from uh, your infrastructure. So in a moment, we are going to remove these two parts. Because the, the list of employees and the set of employees should be just part of the React component. But right now, let's keep it this way. As you can see, the service, it's orchestrating the work of two other elements of DDD that are repositories. Okay, so it's completely full in the definition that I give you about DDD services. But it's not enough because uh, we uh, merge in a, in a unique file what we merge the business the actual business logic that is this one okay the invariant the the business rules with infrastructure with calling the backend getting the data 
calling the backend to update something. Remember that DDD is about keeping the domain as pure as possible. So we need to put this stuff in a different object. And what is the kind of object that we need? We need what is called an aggregate. As you can see, I added another two elements of uh, DDD, and that is uh, aggregates and value objects. Let me show you the code, and then I will talk about the definition. So as you can see, I take the, all the same signature as before, but I put the promote business logic inside another object called employee aggregate. I use a factory to create an aggregate that notice that the, it depends just on the, on the input data, on the promote and on the reviews. It does not depend on the infrastructure. This is very, very important when you create domain driven design elements like aggregates, the aggregate should not know about your infrastructure in any case. How the aggregate works? Okay, before taking a look at the code, let's take a look at the um, definition on the right. An aggregate is a cluster of domain objects, entities or value object, and I will explain what the value object is in a moment, that can be treated as single unit. Their main purpose is to ensure the validity of the business tool related to the main. Oh, sorry, here there is a typo. Okay, just ignore, ignore that. So the aggregate is, um, has the responsibility to keep the data about the employee and the reviews, and also to keep the business rules safe in an isolated uh, environment. As you can see, I have in the aggregate, I have the employee, so I have the entity, and I have a ranking object that I create with this simple factory method called create ranking value object. What is a value object? A value, value object are objects that are known only by the properties and values, like addresses or 2D or 3D points. The main difference with entities is that to check a quality, of two entities, you check the IDs. To check the quality of two value objects, you check the values. So two addresses are the same if they have the same values. Two points are considered the same if they have the same value of X and Y. And so two ranking objects are considered equal if they have the same number of reviews and the same number of average ranking. So I create a small value object that I use it in my promote, in my promote business logic method. So this is exactly the same method as before with one major difference. I choose to, um, sorry, to create a small function called freeze that just clone the object with Lodash and then invoke a deep freeze of all the aggregate methods. Why I choose to do that? Because in order to work as an aggregate, uh, it's, it should be not be possible to change the promoted uh, property directly. I, sh I, um, I need to um, make mandatory to other developers to use my promote method. In order to do that, I can use a lot of techniques. I can use a property descriptor. I can use proxies. I decided to do with frozen objects, immutable objects. So as you can see, what I do in the promote method is that if the invariant, if the business rule are not matched, are not, are not valid, I just return a clone of my aggregate without changing it. If the, if the business rule are pass, pass, then I just create a copy of my aggregate changing the promoted to two. I use a dot prop immutable. It is just a simple utility that change an object by copy and not by reference. In this way, I can use the, the new employee, the result of the aggregate, and I can check that if the promoted is still false after that I call the, the promote method, I can assume that something were wrong and I just throw an error. 
Otherwise, I just call the new employees, set employees, and so on. Okay, this is not this is cool because we have the business logic inside a pure object, so it's completely testable, but it's far from perfect because we lost one feature that we had before. As you can see, I don't have a specific error right now. Before I have a specific error post for specific uh, business rule invalidation. Right now I have just a simple error. My UI just answer, you cannot be promoted without explaining why it's happening. So I lose something very, very important. And then we'll get the same feature in the next commit. Or uh, as I explained before, I'm using uh, the history also to show the errors that my team and I made when we was working in, with the transition from the messy code base that we took in from the DDD perspective, okay? So actually we did this kind of errors. We lose the stuff while moving stuff out. So how can we make this uh, aggregate better? Well, I created uh, a simple enum of results type where you can be okay, it can be not enough review. So when I check the number of reviews and I can also check the ranking that is too low. Then inside the promote, I just use, uh, I just return, not just the aggregate, but a result type. So I return when the ranking are not enough, I return a result type that is not enough reviews. And I return also the number of reviews that are useful to create the error to send to the, um, to the UI. In a similar scenario, if my ranking is not high enough, I create a ranking to low kind of return object with the average ranking in order to print the error. If everything goes correctly, I just return a, an okay result and I return the new aggregate. How the service change in this way? Well, our service becomes simpler because I use it the, the result types because I just need the promote now and I, I, don't, I don't need the set employees and that with a lot of stuff from React. So also my uh, service, it's pure now. And what I do is that I call the promote, then I take the result. If the result is okay, I invoke the server. So I update also the server with the same uh, data. And then in the app, when I call the promote from the service, and so I will get the result from the aggregate. I check the error type. If I have an error, I use a window alert or okay. In a real application, I should use a toast or something like that. Okay, be kind with me about window alert. I show the error on the screen. In the other cases, if, if everything goes correctly, I just update the state of React because I know that my result will be okay. So let's review before going deeper our, our, our architecture. We have the app. The app call a service and the service is an object that talker states repositories and aggregates in order to fulfill my commands. The service use an aggregate and the aggregate is just a pure object that just depends on the input parameter. This is the most important thing when working with uh, domain models. If you can keep your model pure from the outside dependencies from your infrastructure, it will be independent from the framework. Notice that this code, this code that is actually a front-end code can be easily ported to Node, for example, with exactly the same code. So I can use the same code base to check for, um, for example, bad requests in a, in, a, in, a, in a REST API. And this is doable just because I did not use any kind of front-end framework or infrastructure inside my domain. So, okay, what happens when my application grows bigger? 
what happens is usually that I need to uh, pieces of software to communicate each other. And the best way to let pieces of application to communicate in an indirect way is via events. So I will introduce you the, the, last, um, the last element of my um, DDD vocabulary that are called the domain events. I added another element of my infrastructure that is an event bus, okay? This event bus, just have two simple methods, okay? As a subscribe that had a callback to an array of subscribers. This is one, okay? It's very, very simple. And then I have a publish method that takes a type and the payload. It checks that the type is uh, inside a vocabulary of types, of events, sorry. So I have my employee promoted event. This is the only domain event that I want to manage right now. And then when I click Publish, I just call all the subscribers and I pass the event to all the subscribers. That's it. Uh, what is a domain event? Domain event is something happen that is relevant to your domain. Their name should be in past tense in order to communicate that something is already happened in the system. Notice that an event is not a command. An event happened after a command, it's the result of the command. So it's always in past tense, like amply promoted. Notice this is very, very similar to Redux. Also in Redux, the events are passed in past tense. And this is, if you want, is the father of Redux. Domain events are, in a way, uh, what generated the, the Elm architecture, then then generated Redux, OK? How can I use the event bus? OK, in this simple scenario, I just added a subscriber to the index, OK? But for example, what, uh, what we did with that in the original software was to use that to sy synchronize events from backend to server, uh, to backend to frontend, sorry, because we had the backend based on events. So what happened is that we click on promote, the, we create an event and we send it to the server. The server take the event, update the database, and then send the response as an event to the client. Right now it's too complicated for it's out of scope for this introductionary talk. So for now, just keep a console log, okay? The service, it, it's quite changed because I took the event bus and I set, uh, I pass the event bus down the uh, aggregate. As you noticed here, I removed the promote from the um, uh, employee repository because I will not use it anymore because I want to use the socket system from before, okay? So the aggregate now takes the, the element bus as an input parameter. And then after that it change the aggregate, it just publish an event on the on the system. Uh, okay, it's cool because like before, our domain just depends on input parameters. But there is one problem in this in first implementation. What I say to you before is that um, domain models should be uh, protected by uh, the infrastructure. And with infrastructure, I don't mean just frameworks, OK? Also, your code could be an infrastructure. For example, the event bus is not related to domain. It's, it's not related to data. It's an infrastructure element. So it should be removed from your domain. Just like we said that you should remove frameworks from domain. And we can do that with a simple level of indirection. So we just change a small, uh, we change, change the aggregate a little bit. So we have the events, okay. In, we create an array inside the aggregate. I create a simple method called release events that I clone the original events in order to make it, you know, frozen. And then I reset the, my events. And then I return the events to, my, the, to the user of my public API. Who populate these events? 
Well, the promote method. Instead of publishing the event to the event bus, it just adds the event to this event list, to the array. The employee service changes a bit because what it does is that it takes the result, it just releases the event, so it took the event from the aggregate and reset it, they are empty after the invocation, and then for each event that is generated uh, in the aggregate, it published it on the event bus. So I added a simple level of indirection. And that's it. Our aggregate returned to be as pure as possible. Let's add the last commit. The last commit has a bunch of tests about uh, the, my, my aggregate. And as you will see, the tests are the, the proof that my model is actually working without using any kind of uh, data from outside. I just create an aggregate, okay? The aggregate should be immutable. So I test that when I change the promoted attribute directly, this code should throw because it's, it will be not possible because I froze the element. It should return a not enough review error, okay? It should return not ranking too low error. It should return a promoted employee if I am in a valid condition. So if I create a bunch of review that are successful, that are valid variants, I just have a promoted employees. At last, when I promote an employee and it is okay, I, I, I have in my events, one event of type employee promoted. And after I call release event, I have zero element in my array. So it's uh, it's important, okay? I can call again and promote it. And if, if something, and if it's valid again, I get another event. And that's it. That's all the code that I will show you. So I'm ready to conclude my talk. Uh, so why you should care? So uh, thanks to this talk, I hope that you learned that it's possible to implement some of the most important DDD principles inside the uh, existing front-end application. But why should you care? Well, because domain, the business logic, the actual rules of your business are the most valuable part of your software. All the rest is just noise most of the time. If you have a uh, application that should last, I don't know, uh, for more than five or 10 years, probably your framework, your infrastructure will change during time. And you will be, you will be needed to move your domain from an application to another application. And if you keep your domain as pure as possible, uh, it's better because it's, uh, you know, it will not depend on any external dependency. And it's also more testable, like you saw in my code. In a nutshell, you should defend domain from frameworks as much as possible. And, uh, and there's also another reason for that. If you are working on an existing project and you want to you know, modernate your code base, it's easier to introduce principle in existing code base instead of frameworks. Uh, for example, the project in Backbone that I talked to you before, the, the client's uh, team at the beginning wanted to introduce React with another build and uh, a strangle fig application pattern. But we stopped them because to have a second build was very, very difficult to manage in the long term. So we decided to, to say, okay, let's start to remove Backbone from your business logic. Then we can start creating a second application that will eat the, the young one and will put pure domain in the new application that is in React. Like I show you in my, in my example, the domain was pure from React ecosystem. So we can move the same code uh, to React, to Vue, to Angular, or to Web Component if you want. I want to conclude my talk with this uh, quote from Leonardo da Vinci that say the simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Because what you saw is actually, um, uh, is actually simple, but it's not easy, okay? Uh, as you saw, it took 
a, a, a lot of trial and error also for a senior developer. So don't ever confuse simplicity with easy to do. Simplicity is quite hard to achieve, but it's probably the most important um, things that you have to keep in mind while building a large and complex architecture. Try to keep as much as simple as possible. Uh, we are hiring. We are a fully remote company. So if you want to work with us from your home or from whatever you want, uh, just write to our recruitment email. We have a, a bunch of open positions about backend, frontend, UX, and also cloud engineer, I think. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. So thank you very much for a great talk. Strauss, is that correct? Did I pronounce yeah, it correctly? Actually, yeah, yeah. So we have to learn, right? So uh, <laughs> let me first uh, quickly start with like, please folks, do not forget to ask your questions in the chat or in the Q&A panel next to the video, right? Because this was very interesting. I think it opens like a lot of possibilities to ask questions. And let me start with something which I'm personally interested in. So first of all, I really think it's really great whenever we get an approach which really tries to separate like side effects from like the, the logic and the data handling and this kind of stuff. So that's always really, really great. But you were uh, like mentioning many times that like it's uh, it's framework independent, which also makes perfect sense as you explained at the end that Backbone comes, Angular goes, Vue, React, who knows what comes in the future, Svelte. But those concepts which you were using like aggregate, value object and whatever, or like repository, those are kind of like here to stay. And there was still quite some boilerplate like freeze, clone and whatever. So why not create really like just the DDD specific framework, which is kind of like a headless, but still because those concepts keep repeating themselves that there maybe could be some reduction of the boilerplate or just that it's easier for people to learn because they can grab some utility method which will kind of guide them about the right thing to do. What is your opinion about that? Uh, yeah, uh, for example, in the real project where we implemented this stuff, we created some simple um, you know, utility function to create aggregates, uh, to merge value objects and so on. Uh, or, for example, release events. Okay, we create a simple interfaces to do that. I did not in this talk because, you know, I will not add another layer, okay? Because it's, uh, when I, usually when I work, I use the, the, the three strider factor uh, technique. The first time I wrote it as is, the second one I just copy paste. At the first attempt, I create a, a small library, I create a refactor. Uh, to create a library is uh, actually, to create a DDDJS, for example, okay. <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. It, it could be doable. Uh, I was thinking about that to create, I don't know if to create exactly a framework, but to create, for example, uh, a small repository with a lot of examples and some kind of small libraries to do that. For example, the event bus. Okay, the event bus was 15 lines, okay. But if you are a junior developer, to create an event bus can be, can be, Difficult to understand at first. Um, and because so, that would be something which can help then people get started because they are not feeling totally lost, like, okay, like they see that like, it makes sense, but then, oh, I, I have nothing to work with. I really have to just start from scratch and this can be a bit like intimidating. So if there would be like some stepping stone where you can get at least some stuff for free, right? That could be yeah, interesting. So you gave me an idea. I will probably try, try to do that after I finish my second book, okay? That... Uh, I'm really, really behind my schedule. So I need there to... is only so much time in a day. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> yes, so right. we actually got some questions. So the first question is from Giorgio Boa. So first of all, he thanks you for the great talk. And what do you is asking about the possible drawbacks of this approach and how hard can be an onboarding into a project? <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, it also depends. Um... Uh, okay, uh, let me think about it. Okay, for a moment. Okay, let's talk about uh, the drawbacks. Uh, the drawbacks, the main drawback is that could be, could seem quite alien for a front end developer sometimes. Okay, uh, not about the entity or repository, because if you think about that, we use it that all the time. Uh, we just call it with different name. Okay, probably uh, we use reviews dot list instead of reviews repository, but the concept is quite the same. 
aggregates, uh, it's quite uh, uh, hard to understand sometimes because, uh, you know, some frameworks are more based on pure functions like React with UX. Some frameworks like Angular, it's more based on service, on stateless objects because, you know, you have the service annotation. So it could be, it could feel a little alien in an existing project. This is the only drawback that I am, that I can feel. If you are a junior developer and the only thing that you saw about front end is Angular, you probably, you are growing up with the Angular mindset, uh, the same Except. thing for React, okay? Uh, so if you see something that is uh, strange, it could be, you know, uh, it but could be a, a problem. Way and this is, Definitely and it's this, a way of doing things, right? So Exactly. Uh, to solve this, uh, okay, you have, Okay, I just take the junior developer and say, okay, this is other books, just read the books or see this talk, okay? Uh, what a thing that we do to, uh, to solve this problem and that we use uh, what we call uh, architectural decision record. This is a technique that we uh, use in some projects, big projects, where every, tech, every decision that we make from an architectural point of view is put in the markdown element uh, files inside the project. So we don't just explain how to do stuff, but also why we are designed to do that. So that uh, developers that came after you made the decision are quite, uh, you know, they understand also the reasoning or the reasons behind your decision. They can, you know, uh, it's easier to enter in your mind. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, like that's like it. This seems to be like the the biggest thing is that just because it's not so well known in the community, right? That like it takes the time to explain or to communicate properly. So we probably need like more resources talking about this, like this talk or some other blog posts or whatever, which could then show those benefits. So I hope George is happy with the answer. We have another question from Sarah Egli, and the question is: Are there cases when this approach is too ambitious? Or should it be always the goal to apply those principles in your project? Like in your view? Um, okay, I will answer. I will try to tweak the, 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 the question, okay? I don't think there is... A, it, it's not easy to understand when to not use it, okay? Of course, DDD is not a silver bullet like anything in the world, okay? It does not solve all the problem. Uh, what I will answer to the question is that I will introduce it after a while because uh, I really like uh, a pattern that I use in my daily work. It's called spike and stabilize. And so when I have to produce a feature, at first I produce it uh, uh, in a very, very wet way. Okay, I just wrote it down like it comes. Also sometimes without tests. And I try to test with real users. And this is most important from a front-ender perspective because you know, you cannot really test the user behavior. You can just predict it, but you know, you think, okay, the user will click there and then there, but it's not. You they need something click real to work with, right? You need something real to give it, to put in front exactly. of them so you can get some real feedback exactly. because, yeah. Then after a while, what happens is that the code all will evolve because we are changing the features, but after a while it becomes stable. In that phase, I, I stabilize it. So I will introduce some of the DDD techniques uh, because I want to isolate it. I want to test it. Uh, I will not use DDD for in uh, two cases. The first one, if the project is small, if the project is designed to be quite small, probably this is uh, overkill. Okay, if you have uh, a project that is designed to be small, probably is an overkill. And uh, if you are in the first uh, weeks of development, I will not choose, in that case, any kind of infrastructure. I will dare to say that in the first week of, of development, I will not choose any framework if possible. I will just keep with, I don't say document.write, okay, but something very, very stupid to print down HTML and CSS because you don't actually know how the software will evolve, okay? You can have a backlog, you can have a plan, but what happens in real life that the plan gets screwed up like always? So That's don't add it at the beginning. Wait for something to happen. And when you need the, the urge to protect your domain, this is the technique that you need to use. 
So basically larger projects and like after some delay when some patterns become more like clear and like what like after some experimenting, exactly. so leaving yourself some room for experimentation. And after this phase has passed and some things are kind of clear that this will be like this and like that, then this technique can help you to like fix it in the code in such a way that it's then very bet easier to maintain and more robust and easier to test, if I understand that correctly. Exactly. This is why I started with a simple React project without anything at all, because I wanted to show you how to introduce an existing application. Makes perfect sense. So do we have some other questions? Please, folks, do not hesitate. And besides that, I see here one thing. So what is, in your opinion, like the reason why the domain-driven design and the front-end community does not communicate so much or like that those concepts are not so well known between each other? Oh, uh... Okay, this is a, this is an art question. I, I actually don't know that. And I think that uh, it's uh, because of JavaScript. You know, uh, JavaScript is a strange language. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you took it from, uh, you know, uh, people that came from C Sharp or Java, that are the, the, the people that work with DDD are usually work with these kind of languages. Uh, not today. Today you can do that also in PHP, for example. But their, their, that concept are born in that communities. And you know what Java developers think about JavaScript and what JavaScript developers think about Java. Sometimes, today, yeah. Today we have TypeScript. TypeScript could be a lingua franca, for example. Uh, yeah, it seems to be bringing like the best of both worlds. You can go exactly. dynamic, you can just set the strict flag and go like fully hardcore. So it's like up to you. You can switch it later once you know what you are doing. So it sounds like a good stepping stone. Yeah, so exactly. Uh, well be. Like I said in the talk, I decided to do that with JavaScript because this is a JavaScript uh, conference. And I want to demonstrate that you don't need types to implement principles. You just Makes need sense. principles. Makes sense. Probably and only isolation. If I probably do this talk to a DDD community, probably I should switch to TypeScript with a code in order to let them better understand what I mean. I so think this is the main problem. So they don't run away screaming that like, oh no, that's exactly. too much. Like we have our safety. Okay, now we can listen. Exactly. Makes perfect sense. So thank you for your answer. I think then, yeah, there are no more questions. So with that being said, then... Stras, thank you very much for this amazing talk and hopefully we can see you at some future edition of the JS Day Italy. Thank you yeah, again and have a great rest of the day. Okay, bye-bye. Ciao.